let's talk about adhesion in food. Now, adhesion is when two different substances stick to each other. That's not to be confused with cohesion, where you have the same substance sticking to itself. Now, you've probably noticed that some things are much better at sticking to other things, say this little gummy fish, than others. For example, this chocolate. If I want to stick the chocolate to the gummy fish, mm, not having huge amounts of success here, although not bad but most of this is on the fish side. So let's think about what it is that makes the fish sticky and the chocolate less sticky and what we can do to control this. The type of adhesion which you are most familiar with, both from regular life and from food, is what I'm going to call mechanical adhesion. And it's how Elmer's glue works. So let's say you have a solid and we're gonna look at this solid uh, way zoomed in so that we can see how rough it surfaces. And if we want to stick this to something, one of the easiest and most popular ways to do so is to pour a liquid that is somewhat polymeric. That means it has long chains like starches or proteins have, and pour that liquid all over the solid surface. And that liquid will flow into the different rough bits on the solid surface. So when this liquid dries, we end up with it completely stuck to our solid, not because it has formed a bond necessarily with our solid, but because it is mechanically connected to the solid by being sort of poured into all its little bumps and cracks and so on. And in fact, this is why something like Elmer's glue doesn't work so well if you want to glue something to a piece of plastic because the piece of plastic isn't very rough. You might have to go over it with uh, sandpaper to roughen it up. And of course, while it is still liquid, you could bring another solid into contact with the material and use this liquid to stick the two together mechanically. We do have a whole bunch of other ways things can adhere to each other based on interactions at the molecular level. So I'm going to zoom way in and draw these at a molecular scale to give you an idea how they work then zoomed out to larger scale. Let's discuss these in reverse order. First up, we have polar interactions where you have, for example, the end of a fatty acid that's been cleaved off of a fat will end up having a polar end, a part where there's these oxygens that really are uh, out looking for electrons and they will mix well with other things that have unbalanced electrons that they can pair with. So that's why something like this might like water, or sugars, uh, or other polar compounds. Hydrogen bonds are something we see quite a bit in water, but also between other sorts of molecules where the same sort of thing happens. It's kind of a special case uh, in many ways of the uh, polar interactions. Star of simplification coming in there. Um, in this case, if we look at the water, oxygen has this unpaired set of electrons, or um, <clears throat> unbonded, forgive me, a set of electrons hanging out on this side. And so you'll often see kind of a not really strong actual covalent bond, but a different sort of bond sticking uh, water, the hydrogens off of one water to the oxygen off of another. And that's called a hydrogen bond. It's not as strong as a covalent bond, but it is responsible for the fact that water has a really high boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius, compared to things that have similar molecular structure to water. For example, sulfur dioxide, which is in fact a gas at room temperature, so its boiling point is much, much lower. Finally, we come to van der Waals forces, and van der Waals forces are everywhere between all things. It's kind of like the force. Van der Waals holds the universe together. And what we mean by that is any molecule has uh, its electrons in a cloud around it 
kind of you can sort of think of them as in constant motion, star of simplification. And from moment to moment, those uh, electrons will tend to be on one side of the molecule or on the other. And that can create fleeting attractions between uh, any two molecules. It works kind of between everything. And so this is an attraction that you see um, it's very, very weak because <clears throat> we haven't rearranged any bonds or anything. But uh, the longer the molecule or the more surface area between two things that are touching, the more chance that van der Waals can be what is in fact holding this thing together. And there was a big splash a number of years ago when we learned that gecko lizards, in fact, um, are walking up walls due to van der Waals forces and not little suction cups on their feet or anything like that. Okay, that's not a very good gecko, but it's meant to be a uh, gecko. Because on their feet, they have special kind of skin that has a huge amount of surface area, lots and lots and lots and lots of little fiddly bits. Um, and all of that surface area means that this super weak attraction called van der Waals forces is able to hold the thing as big as a gecko, okay, not that big, still small, but a lot bigger than a molecule up on the wall. And it's van der Waals forces that, for example, hold solid fats together in their fat crystals. There's two other bonds that happen um, in adhesion situations, uh, although they happen uh, somewhat less often in food, at least on the home scale, but can happen uh, in food, certainly on the commercial scale. And these are covalent bonds and ionic bonds. Co uh, ionic bonds, when you have ionic compounds, that uh, something with a plus charge and something with a negative charge, that means they will tend to be very strongly attracted to each other. Um, I'm not going to go into that too deeply, but a covalent bond is, for example, what you're using when you use epoxy to stick item A to item B. There aren't a lot of good food epoxies, so that's not really a thing that uh, we can do with food. However, there are some enzymes that are capable of what we call cross-linking uh, different food molecules. So uh, enzymes that are capable of cross-linking, in particular, proteins uh, to make um, something, two uh, items that were previously not attached to each other, adhere to make them stick. So, for example, I invite you after this, if you're interested, to go Google transglutaminase. It ends A-S-E. That's what tells you it's a enzyme, as mentioned up here, and see uh, what you can do with it. You can basically use that to covalently link and adhere different types of proteins to each other. So take a moment and think, what does this all mean for chocolate-covered strawberries? When I think about this, I see pretty much two forms of adhesion going on here, and I hope you do too. First up, because we have liquid chocolate coming in, and it has basically a polymeric function, and it is coating the strawberry, which doesn't have a whole lot of surface roughness, but certainly where the uh, little seeds are is rough. Uh, we will have some mechanical adhesion between the liquid chocolate and the solid strawberry that then as the chocolate sets, we'll have a little bit of interlocking and things will hold on to each other. We'll also have, I think, the only other thing that can be happening here is a van der Waals type adhesion. And this second one is why it ends up being, uh, in my mind, critically important that the strawberry, that's meant to show water, is completely dried off. Why? Because if we have, uh, we need for van der Waals to work intimate, very, very, very close contact between our two surfaces. And if there is water on the strawberry, that gets in the middle, that gets in the way 
between the chocolate and the strawberry being able to closely contact each other. So I think the strawberry has got to be very dry, um, and I think the chocolate has to have a chance to flow and cover all of the little uh, dots and divots on the strawberry to develop both a, as much of a mechanical interlink as it can, and also to have as much surface area as possible so Van der Waals forces can take over.